Um, and next week I'm going to do some of the funnies. So I'm going to show, I'm going to do the stand, the the slightly more comic elements and show uh, of philosophy and just show people that actually this is funny. I mean, for instance, the funniest, I'm doing possibly, possibly, one of the funniest books ever written. It was by Thomas More Utopia. It's hilarious. It's the Monty Python of its day. So he has, for instance, I'll just give you a line from it. It's possibly the best joke, so I'm giving away my material. This is but, only one of them, though. This is one of them. But Thomas, not that one. <clears throat> OK. But, but that wouldn't work at all. No, no, no. For in the fields of Britain, even as we live, there is a dreadful beast laying waste to villages, creating poverty, inspiring misery. Well, <laughs> says Thomas More, we are better strap on my armour and we'll do battle with this fearful dragon. <laughs> No, doing battle with no good on it. But perhaps you could do some good. You could destroy this beast. Peculiarly you, Thomas, could destroy it. Shall I name it for you? Yes, I will get my weapons. What is it but sheep? What do you mean? I own more sheep than anyone in Britain. I know, sir. And think what those sheep do. All the villages you lay waste. All the people you make destitute. And where are they now, I ask you? So it's both very funny (laughs) and very powerful. Because everybody is thinking I'm going to be a knight in shining armor. And it is sheep and they are destroying Britain. So it's that kind of paradox you can really get on performances. Right. And if I time the joke right, it's funny. (laughs) What I'm, what I'm going to do next, I'm just going to play you a clip because I'd like I'd like to ask you where you see comedy and radio in relation to other arts. Okay. But first of all, uh, this is an extract from um, a Melvin Bragg series that uh, was on on Radio Four, I think last week, which I, I think you did hear. It was I on it most days, so you, you might not have heard all of it, but you heard you heard heard some of it, uh, I think. Yeah, I did. Arnold, for better or worse, and I'm not sure that this is actually what he said, but it's what commentators have claimed he said, uh, is is used by those who want to make culture with a big C into a sort of citadel, a walled citadel. And very often, forgive me, Tiffany, they, they, they behave like environmentalists. You know, we've got to protect this walled citadel against the modern world, against mass culture. But environments the... are protected often, aren't they, against it, the outside world? Indeed. I mean, all environments are not open to everybody, otherwise they wouldn't be controlled environments, no, but, and a lot but, of things would go. But Arnold, I mean, one of the punchlines of Arnold is let's open it up beyond the cliques of specialists and uh, the civilised, as he puts it. Let's have access to that citadel. I mean, he wasn't a sort of, you know, stop the world, I want to get off sort of person at all, although that's how he's been interpreted. I think the turning of culture into a noun that has that baggage in a big C is entirely due to Arnold, and that's very strong still. But I think the anthropological definition has certainly in academic circles, and your, your series has covered cult, the rise of cultural studies, the debates within anthropology, uh, has become much more central, I think, to intellectual debate. So both, I think, are, are, were seminal figures in the debate about culture. You're riding two horses. I'm backing both horses. I mean, I tend to see Arnold as the enemy, but actually I reread him for this. And it's very convoluted stuff. I mean, the essays are all over the place uh, in, in some respects. I mean, the big enemy seems to be nonconformist dissenters who, who don't subscribe to the Church of England, which tends to get lost in translation when you look at it now. But uh, I tend to see him as the enemy, but that doesn't mean he isn't important. I think culture with a big C is very strong in certain citadels, and it reduces Arnold to a very culture narrow range C, of human you mean activities. Received tradi- sorry, Christopher. Yeah. Culture of the big C, you're meaning received traditional culture. Yeah. And the opera, the ballet, the the Greek classics, the established yeah. drama, that is the culture with a big yeah, C. I, I, I got into trouble. That's still uh, very important and very importantly held by some people. Of course it is. And, and, and when I was chairing the Arts Council, I got into trouble for trying to bring in community arts and public art and the way in which those traditional arts shade into the creative industries. Open it up a bit because culture is an evolving thing. I think the disastrous thing that some people have taken from Arnold is that culture is fixed in some way. And that, you know, you, you, you defend the citadel of these fixed subjects and you don't accept that the world has moved on and actually they should be nourished by that. So I think that, that, that I lived, actually, for five years as a debate. 
Tiffany, do you want to reply to that? Well, I think, I think you won, Christopher. I think you won. I think you succeeded. And although those art forms still exist, ballet and opera, and they receive huge subsidies, I don't think they're culturally validated. Certainly, if you look at the Arts Council, they talk about knitting, they talk about cooking. And I think that is... What do you expen- mean, culture? I'm awfully sorry. If, if well, it at- must be people here that make me interrupt more than usual, but why... <laughs> what, do you mean, what do you mean by culturally validated of opera and ballet? Some very good young choreographers are creating extraordinary ballets which can only be called ballets of today, contemporary ballets. Yes, but I mean culturally in terms of the way opinion formers talk about them and the way that arts leaders talk about them, I don't think they celebrate them in the same way. I think what we've got is almost like a privatisation of the high arts where people are free to engage with them and they still exist, but they're not promoted and certainly not promoted in schools and I don't think they're promoted... I often look, for example, in the obituary pages. I don't know why. (laughs) Maybe it's a slightly gothic tendency in myself, but I'm really struck by the dominance of rock musicians that are dying and being paid huge pages um, devoted to their lives. Now, I just think what we have now is a culture which venerates and applauds pop culture over instead of high culture. I think, I think that's what's happened, which is why I think you then have to try and rebalance it a little bit. I think it's gone too far. But that's not true of the public sector at all. I mean, the, the, the great bulk of the public resource going into the arts goes into opera companies, symphony orchestras, and lots of mouths to feed in the arts. Yes, I mean, at the edges, there's all sorts of... Rather like... I'm told by my uh, zoological friends that the site of contestation is the edge of the pond. In the middle of the pond, not much happens, but at the edge of the pond, there's all this frantic activity. At the edge of the pond, there's lots of activity at the moment. But the middle of the pond remains relatively as it was in 1947 when the Arts Council was founded. But what do you... Think, think of that clip. So what did I think of the division? Yes, the division. And, and ha- where, where, where what you're working on fits Dan. in in either direction. <laughs> I really don't like divisions like that. It has to be said. Um, <laughs> because they polarise a debate that I actually don't think can be usefully discussed that way. Okay. So what I mean by that is, let me give you an example. I, what I like is, I'm, on one level, I'm a horrible elitist, but on another level, hmm. Uh, so I like stuff that challenges me, that makes me think things differently. And I wouldn't draw that line on high versus low culture and say that dra- at ballet was necessarily better than contemporary dance. For the record, I think contemporary dance is much more innovative than ballet because you've got so much more. I learn so much more about what a body can do and get to have to think about how I move so much better by watching... Oh, a dance, a a modern, good modern dance company like Retina Dance, dance than I do from having gone to see ballet, and I have done both. Um, and for me, it misses the why it then becomes this impossible debate is it misses the central thing that a a good culture is doing, and a good culture as you is giving you other options about who you might be, other ways you might be able to think yourself. That's what you're coming. I mean, culture, I guess, I am. In, yeah, it's like what bacteria live in. It's, it's the extra <laughs> things you could be. So, and it should be a bank of extra things. So, different things you could look for. Now, I wouldn't think that there's high and low. And, I mean, some of the most, some of the cleverest people I know are all travellers who are all steeped in this terribly low in inverted commerce culture. But what they can do with this and what they think with it is fairly profound. Um, And I've also in my day known an awful lot of people who assume that if you are into the high culture, that must mean you are clever. I'm sure we can all think of them. I don't need to mention names. Um, And lots of them on Radio 4, though. Um, And and, and that is... And and I sit there thinking, you're cretinous. There there is no thought going in here. You have a stock sequence of of criticisms that are not criticisms that were answered 40 years ago. and, And you're going nowhere. The point is to make it challenging and to give people other options, other ways they might understand themselves. And for me, that's what I guess would be my inheritor of culture. That's what culture should be about. It should be about just giving you other ways to think. So I don't like the division. OK, well, we'll, we'll, we'll break it down as much as we can. Yes, thank you very much. So, uh, so, 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 so when you work on radio, uh, how different do you find that to live performance? It is different, actually. It surprises me how different it is. Um, Because you haven't got an audience in front of you, so you are being your own audience, it gives you a very different feel about um, how you perform. Because radio, you have to be very, very self-reliant. 
So you have to, and you have to keep on going because you're not feeding off from a audience energy. Um, and so you have to. So I always say one of the things I love about Phonic is that it taught me how to act because and it's cheaper than going to rada however much they put up the prices it's cheaper than going to rada because um it makes you if you're kind of having to do it and you're having to carry a show yourself you've got to be able to move your moods around very very quickly and keep yourself going even if you've bummed up a line and then with an audience that's different because with an audience you can play with the audience energy um so i love doing it on radio and it, i've certainly learnt over the years a lot by having to do it live on radio in front of people um so i think it's different obviously it's also different because you've also got to work out what music track you're playing afterwards and you can sometimes hear it in the performance i'm thinking oh god i haven't keyed that up as i'm carrying <laughs> on going so it also teaches you infinite flexibility <laughs> and and what about youtube because you, you do use youtube do, do you feel you get feedback from that or is it just sometimes. a bit mysterious as to what, what's going on sometimes sometimes you get feedback it depends youtube is all about what you call the thing and I, this is what i've learned so for instance if you say put something called the lures made simple on youtube you'll get an awful lot of hits because people want to the lures is a very difficult postmodern philosopher so if you have a lovely good quick lecture that makes one of his central problems simple you get thousands of hits but if you actually call things like what they are um you don't get any hits at all so it's so for me youtube is a game of titles <laughs> So, if so, I, so uh, do the audience complain? I mean, do, do you get comments saying um, this is not what I expected? No, 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 no. no. So you just carry on. I carry on. Coming yeah. up with search-friendly titles. Yeah, yeah. Dear, I do. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. very sad. Isn't well, it? well, I never totally un. It, it, an un. Uh, my, my. I mean, I won't just make up titles. I'm not, not going to do that. But certainly. Um, I mean, the Deleuze made simple. I wouldn't have ever have called it that. But I, on an off chance, I was a bit squiffy when I put it in and I couldn't remember the title, so I just put Deleuze made simple. And actually, that was rather a good description. <laughs> or I have another one, a four-minute introduction to Foucault. Now everybody needs a four-minute introduction <laughs> to Foucault. I certainly do. <laughs> um, so I'm doing that. I'm doing the four-minute four Foucault, History of Sexuality, Volume 1, in lots of different voices. So Is what, it? what, at the Northcott Theatre? Yeah, it's very funny. Very, well, I very think funny. people will go to, for that alone. And I do the three-minute marks as well. Can, Mark you, can you remind us of the date? Third, day the after third. Candlemas. Third of February. It's a, it's a Sunday, third of February. Okay. Um, and I'm in the bar, so you can be very drunk while I'm performing. It's fine. I don't mind. I'm hoping for hecklers. But yes, I do the Introduction to History of Sexuality, Volume 1, in four minutes. Well, I think that's, that's what everybody needs. That's what everybody needs. It's the one where he challenges you about um, what you think about your sexuality. So you so um, it's the, it has lovely lines like we seem to have confused our sexuality with our identity. Tell me you who have the hots for animal, vegetable, and mineral, or I'll tell you who you are. It's that okay. Kind of well, I'm going to move on now. Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm going to move on because we're running out of time. I think you've got to go sometime soon. 